We're so excited today to have with us Kathleen Rooney. Kathleen is the founding editor of Rose Metal Press, a nonprofit publisher of literary work in hybrid genres, and a founding member of Poems While You Wait, which is this really awesome team of poets and their typewriters who write poetry on the spot, commissioned poetry on the spot, I should say, which I think is just a fabulous way to get poetry out in the world. Kathleen also teaches English at DePaul University in Chicago. She's a reviewer and critic, a poet, and a novelist. Many of you know her due to her best-selling novel, Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk, and we're here today to talk with Kathleen about her new novel, which is coming out August 11th, Cher Ami and Major Wittesley. And we both stumble over that Whittlesley name. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's a tricky one. Yeah. So maybe maybe you can give us a brief synopsis of the book, including how you pronounce the title correctly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my book, as you said, is uh, Shara Me and Major Whittlesey. And I think... Um, you know, the sort of synopsis is in a way built into the title. And so it is about two characters, uh, one of whom is Shara Me, who's this homing pigeon. Um, they're both real people uh, or real, I guess, I yeah, I'm going to stick to people. I think we can extend personhood to animals. And I think, you know, I don't want to jump ahead of questions, but one of the things that I was excited about this book is that it's half from Shara Me, the pigeon, and half from um, Charles Whittlesey, the soldier. And so they were both together in this sort of cataclysmic battle in World War One, um, the Battle of the Meuse-Argonne Forest. And I won't go too deep into this short synopsis into the military history, but um, sort of the two of these characters came from very different backgrounds, and then their lives intersected over this five-day battle and this incident. And basically, Shara Me is the pigeon who carried this message during a friendly fire incident that saved this group of soldiers uh, from being killed by their own forces. And so I think, you know, uh, she's a cute pigeon, she's stuffed, she's in the Smithsonian. Um, and I hope that her, her cuteness and her sweetness comes through. But I tried really hard to make it a book that's actually about this pretty serious incident. Um, and that I think was so famous at the time, but most people have never heard of now. So kind of like with Lillian, I wanted to bring these two figures who I thought were remarkable back into the light and um, make them part of our ongoing conversation now, a hundred years later. Yeah. You know, I, Emily has finished the novel. I'm halfway through at this point and I am in love with Cher Ami. Um, and I, you know, I went through a phase where I read a lot of World War I novels and memoirs and I, I got a little bit burnt out. So when I first saw the subject matter of your novel, I thought, hmm, well, We'll see. I was immediately drawn in and I, I love both of these characters and I love how much you have so much historical background and details, yet it's so full of humor and living and life and the struggle, but the beauty of it at the same time. Thank you. Yeah. 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 I, I appreciate, um, I'm glad that, thank you for finishing it and um, thank you for being halfway through. And I think, you know, just to jump in, I think I, I've been really fascinated with World War One since I was a kid. And so I, I think the reason I wanted to write this is it's a story I hadn't heard. And then I also knew with the pigeon I could look at, like you said, I mean, it's material that those of us who follow that period of history are probably really, really familiar with, but it gives it I mean, the obvious pun that I'm just going to go for is the bird's eye view um, <laughs> that we haven't seen or that I haven't seen. You know, as far as I know, there hasn't been this like pigeon based account. So I I'm glad that you found it unusual. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Very unusual. And also, I mean, I wondered how you researched not only, you know, obviously this event, but also just, you know, Pigeonhood. I'm going to read just a little piece of the book where um, Sheremy's talking about her parents and being raised by her parents. And she says, the fact that birds can produce milk surprises most humans and their mammalian cousins who assume themselves to hold a monopoly on lactation. <laughs> and then you go on to describe, you know, how they do produce milk and feed their young. So how did you research both that part of World War One and being a pigeon. 
Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, I love research, and I think um, it's my favorite phase. I've you know said this before because in the research phase, your book is going to be the greatest, right? When you're just in research, it's going to be the best book about pigeons ever. And then, of course, you start writing it, and you know it becomes a more real thing, and it's it's less perfect than you imagined. But I got really into reading not just from our time period looking back at World War One, but accounts of World War One at the time, which I think is really helpful when you're doing historical stuff. So I, you know, for the Whittlesey stuff, I really focused on newspaper stories and articles from the day because the, I mean, the sad thing at the time, but the great thing for a researcher is that the Lost Battalion, this group of soldiers he was part of, became so notorious, so renowned, like the entire, you know, home front, the world was sort of watching and following these breathless accounts in newspapers by, um, I make Damon Runyon a character because he was covering it. Um, But the New York Times, I mean, because they were a group of soldiers from New York, and because New York is so big in sort of the collective imagination, there was tons of material sort of about their experience. And then with the pigeons, you know, pigeons used to be so beloved by humans. It's a recent thing that you hear them called rats with wings or dismissed as dirty. And, you know, prior to about the 60s, pigeons and humans lived so closely together. I mean, they were a food source, which I don't love as a vegetarian, (laughs) but I get it. Um, You know, they were pets, they were um, companions, they were raced. They were used for communication, as you see in the book. So there's all this wealth of of information. And so I just got a lot of books from about like the 1890s to the 1920s to kind of immerse myself in pigeon behavior books um, so that I could kind of write how Cheryl Mee would act and what it would be like to be her. And then also what the sort of pigeon carriers, the, you know, signal corps guys, the soldiers who would have been the pigeon men would have known and would have done and how they would have cared for them. So it was really um, I'm glad you liked it. I got so into pigeons. I, I've always loved them, but after reading this book, I'm like a crazy pigeon lady. I'll just like talk your ear off, so I'll I'll stop. There. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and anybody, you all should be following Kathleen's Twitter feed because she posts a lot of really cute pigeon images and videos. Um, so I've been really enjoying those. <laughs> Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So why why did they stop? You know what happened in the '60s that they're not so fond of a, a pet and that sort of thing. Yeah, I think you know from what I can tell, it had a lot again to do with New York City and sort of the kind of decline. You know, some of what I touched on in Lillian Boxfish, the way that the city went through this neglect and this uh, disinvestment and, you know, the crime going up and the white flight and sort of this, I mean, you kind of see it now in some of the prejudice against cities, this idea of cities as this place of low life or less than. And I think the pigeons became this symbol of it. And that's when you really started seeing people, you know, in the like Parks Commission of New York sort of putting up signs that say, don't be the pigeons or saying they're dirty. Um, which was sort of this, almost like the broken windows thing, where it was instead of focusing on these bigger, more systemic structural issues, they were focusing on this little window dressing or these tiny things that, uh, you know, ultimately didn't necessarily have that much to do with the decline of the city. And then I think the thing that really solidified it is the, um, I'm loath to talk about Woody Allen, but uh, his movie um, Stardust Memories. And he has the scene where the pigeon gets in and, you know, his character and the female lead talk about how pigeons are rats with wings. And I think, you know, he didn't invent that phrase, but that's what kind of like etched it into the public consciousness. Um, And I think, you know, again, I could go on, but you know, other cities like London, where I think, you know, a thing that I loved as a kid was Mary Poppins, Mm -hmm. but specifically Mm -hmm. feed the birds, tuppence a bag, which brings me to tears just thinking about it. It's such a beautiful song. And it sort of talks about how, you know, charity helps not just the recipient, but the giver, Um, you know, but when they banned feeding the pigeons, like outside St. Paul's or in Trafalgar Square. So I think it, it's become closely associated with this idea of what we want cities to be and who we think belongs in cities. And I think, um, it's a sign of gentrification that I don't totally love. And I hope my book helps people see pigeons as they truly are, which is as incredible creatures. 